I'm Scott Al Miller. It is the 12th of December, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, I'm going to talk about GDP and why nobody cares. No, seriously, like nobody cares. This is actually an important revelation that I've had recently that we've been culturally misled to think that this means a whole lot more than it really does. But don't worry, we're going to talk about all that right after the bump. took a few days off from recording after doing the Ipico because I just needed a little bit of a break because my voice and everything was very rough. Still feel pretty sick, but I do have my voice back and I'm not hacking horribly in between every few minutes of, of footage. So that's a pretty good improvement. Now I've got to play some catch up. I have had a lot of time to spend playing video games with my daughters, which has been fantastic. We are getting really deep into several video games. We've completed several really serious AAA titles, which has been great. Growing up, I didn't really beat that many video games, so doing so now as an adult with my kids is really a sense of accomplishment, which is a funny thing to say. Like I managed to relax and play video games significantly enough that I was able to complete them. Um, I guess that's what you call relaxing. I don't know. That's kind of like finishing a TV series. I managed to finish Stranger Things. You know, anybody can just sit down and press play and it'll happen anyway. So today we're going to talk about GDP or gross domestic product and why it means absolutely nothing. You can check out my previous videos. I've talked about GDP and per capita GDP a bit to explain what they are and how they're calculated. And in doing so, of course, we uncover some important truths like the ability to pass money back and forth between two people accomplishing absolutely nothing creates an appearance of a large GDP. So we already know as a starting point that GDP is a false measurement if we want it to be. My dogs have cornered a squirrel on a wall and uh, they're freaking out. The squirrel loves to mess with them, and if they get too close, he'll actually drop hikamo on them, which is hilarious. Uh, and sometimes he'll manage to get a coconut to fall, like the whole thing. They have this adventure going on. So they're over there if you hear them in the backyard. The, the Final Cut Pro uh, audio reduction will take most of that out, but every so often you can hear the dogs going crazy over there. So anyway, so we already know that you can falsify GDP if you want to. If one country wants to make their GDP appear extremely low, they can do so without changing measurements, simply by changing how their economy moves money around, whether a transaction of paying someone cash for some cheese and cheese for uh, some meat and some meat, or you just directly transfer items around, changes how GDP is measured. Another country can uh, create multiple transactions for a single thing, creating duplicated GDP numbers. It's very easy to see how it can be manipulated. Now, we don't know that anyone is manipulating it, but it's natural that different types of economic activity create different views on GDP. So one country's manner of having, for example, many subcontractors to make a single part creates a very disparately high GDP appearance Whereas another country where a, a, there's a tendency towards a single individual creating entire items uh, appears like a very low GDP, even though the same amount of end result work is being done. And then, of course, comes the measurement of GDP. One country may very diligently measure every single thing that happens in their economy. Another may overlook a great number of things. And this may happen by choice. One country wanting to inflate, another wanting to deflate their GDP numbers. It can also happen through other means that may or may not be intentional. For example, one country, and this is common uh, in certain countries that they'll have, for example, if you're going to assess real estate taxes, they do so at the actual value of the real estate, meaning at the prices that it actually trades at. Another country, like the U.S., may use false numbers, and these may be high or low. It's not saying that they're manipulating it one specific way, but my mother used to be on the Board of Assessment Review for real estate uh, taxation, and one of the things that they did was they had these tax numbers set at a completely different rate than the value of the houses. It was consistent, so it wasn't cheating anybody, but it was very confusing, and it modifies GDP when you do things like that. If you don't use actual numbers, it creates false GDP reporting because that's where those numbers come from. Another country may sell property. For example, someone pays $100,000 for a property, but they only report $20,000 of that sale and pay taxes on that. According to their GDP, you would most likely track the 20,000 because 80,000 of that is not kept within the system. So not only is the tax number, 
artificially low, but the actual GDP is reported at just one fifth of what it actually is. Those little things have a huge effect on what is reported internationally as a GDP. It also misreports the value of people's holdings. So for example, if a person in one country holds a house that is listed as being a million dollars, but in reality is only worth 500,000, we are doubling what we believe to be their personal holdings. Whereas another person who's holding that house that they paid $20,000 for on the books, but that it's actually worth $100,000 if they try to sell it, may have five times as much as what is listed on the books for them. So it's easy to see in that case as well that the, uh, that's not GDP, but the uh, savings or the personal wealth of individuals in different countries can be wildly misinterpreted based on the ways that other things are reported within the economy. Now, all of that is really just to recap why the concept of a GDP is a relatively useless one. It's not completely useless by any stretch, and there's a reason why economists and, and, and just educators and people use it so often. It gives us kind of a very loose rule of thumb means of comparing one nation to another, either on total economy or you can apply it divided by the population on a per capita basis. But it doesn't tell us a lot of really important things either. It doesn't tell us about income disparity, existence of a middle class, or how much of that money exists only in companies or the government or is available to the people. It doesn't tell us how often it moves back and forth or anything like that. So it does give us this really big picture. And if you're comparing very similar economies, say France, Germany, and the UK, then you can make reasonable comparisons because they all operate very similarly, uh, both in their tax structure and their reporting structure and their economic uh, mannerisms. So it's kind of useful in that circumstance. But when you start comparing Germany to China and China to Nicaragua and Nicaragua to South Africa and to uh, and back to the United States, then it tends to be a lot more useless because each of those countries has each of those economic factors very differently. And so what goes into GDP is not reported the same across them or is not represented the same. And so what you get is basically useless numbers. So it's important to understand that it is useful, but you have to keep it in context and understand what it is. It's just one of many tools for attempting to understand differences in economies that fundamentally are so complex that even within a country itself, it's very difficult for that country to understand its own economy to the degree that we would like to understand it in order to make a comparison to another country. These are very difficult things. Economies of countries are relatively opaque. It is very difficult even for the government of the United States or Nicaragua to look at its own economic activity and really know what's happening. There's so many things that are hidden and this is where companies are able or individuals are able to hide taxes that are not being paid. For example, the most simple example in the United States, so many people receive tips. Those tips are taxable and affect what their minimum wage rate is supposed to be. Yet, most of those we know go unreported and there's no way for the government to track them. And so most people who are working in tip-based jobs uh, have a significant, possibly the majority, almost certainly the majority of their income is not being reported. And at best, the government has to guess what the average income is and can never really guess what the income of an individual is. There's so many things there that must be opaque or else they'd be fixed. Same thing with, uh, say, a restaurant that has tipped employees and the restaurant owner steals those tips. Well, that's only able to happen because the government doesn't know what those tips were. If the government knew that those tips existed, they would instantly stop the owner from stealing from the employees because it's both stealing from the employees and tax fraud to the government. The government doesn't like either of those things. They want the employees to get their money. They want the government to get their taxes. The last thing they want is the owner of a business stealing from both of them. So it's that's a great example of why we know there's this opacity because there must be. None of the factors that that would be solved by having transparency into the into the economy in general exist and so the majority, and this is becoming a major problem in the U.S., but is similar in other places already. It's more that the U.S. is losing some transparency that it used to have as a specialty function. Um, that opacity really affects that governments worldwide don't really know what's going on in their countries and never have. In the United States, we used to have the benefit, if that's how you want to look at it, of high transparency due to publicly traded companies. Publicly traded companies under the SEC regulations have to report an awful lot of what they do. It's very hard for them to hide things. Of course they do, but it's very hard for them to hide on a great scale what they do, partially because they have to report to their shareholders and their shareholders are members of the public. Because they're owned publicly, they have to be transparent. It's the only way that it works. And so the U.S. has had, because it's always been the leader in publicly traded companies. It's relatively unique to the U.S. to have so much of the economy publicly traded. And that's where we have the uh, video that I did on the, the 
blind investing in the United States and what makes it so unique. Uh, so check out that video. It's certainly interesting, I think, if that's something that, that you're interested in. Um, but now the United States is moving away from publicly traded companies as the middle class is diminishing and money is moving more heavily into those that of the ultra rich or the, the relatively rich. Uh, and the rich tend to not like publicly traded companies because they're inefficient. They have to report a lot more to the government. There's a lot harder to hide taxes and things like that. And so the rich have a tendency to move their wealth into private equity and similar instruments, which are not publicly traded and do not have to report to anybody. And so because of those things, suddenly the U.S. is losing a great amount of transparency that it used to have into its own economy. And that means a great risk that illegal things will happen, that taxes will not be paid, uh, or that uh, monopolies may exist where no one knows. Because with privately held companies, sometimes you can have all competitors owned by a single entity and no real way to know that. Uh, so the amount of transparency that is assumed in even the American economy can erode pretty quickly, and a lot of people are panicking about that, but it's only eroding in a way that it's going to become like most other countries. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is something that has been relatively uniquely American that is kind of going away. And it's easy to see why the American system of transparency may be great for a public that wants to know and keep tabs on all their businesses, but it is not good for the economy. It is not good for uh, those, those companies. It's not good for profits. And so it's anti-business in most cases. So businesses naturally want to pull themselves away from being publicly traded. It's easy to see if you've ever worked in a publicly traded company just how much corruption there is almost always in those types of companies. They're super inefficient because they have to spend so much time doing paperwork that they don't care about profits and publicly traded companies uh, kind of operate under that it's all about politics instead of profits. And we literally use that term, politics over profits, as a decision-making factor in publicly traded companies. A privately traded company that ever uses politics over profits is called a hobby. But when it's publicly traded, it's just an SEC-regulated organization, but they all act like hobbies. They don't act for the ultimate benefit of the shareholders. If they did, they would stop having shareholders and become private. So that's really just to explain why GDP is opaque and really always will be. We don't have any reasonable way to consider having transparency into what really is creating GDPs. And even if we did, comparing them would still be a matter of opinion because the value of one type of activity versus another is debatable. Okay, all that said is just to bring us to this point. And that point is that essentially... Only Americans care about GDP. And this is not to single out Americans, but GDP, because it is so strong in the way that it is reported in America, GDP represents a really shining star for the American marketing engine. And so in America, they talk about GDP all the time. It is promoted as, how can we be doing badly if our GDP is so high? How can another country's uh, opinions have value if their GDP is so low? Quality of life is tied to GDP. Making money is what matters. It is a score and we're winning, right? GDP is very much seen as this all-encompassing, important way of viewing both total economies, with America having the world's largest GDP, so that's winning on a, on a national scale, and having one of the world's highest per capita GDPs, of course, really tiny countries sometimes pull ahead. You'll see Switzerland or Ireland sometimes have the highest. Norway, these are really small countries that are only the same size as a city in the U.S. So the U.S. normally overlooks those and doesn't see it as a big deal if some of them pull ahead from time to time. But in general, on any large scale, the United States has the largest per capita GDP. So this is seen as winning in so many ways. And it is used as a powerful marketing engine to convince Americans that doing anything abroad is just a waste of time or potentially scary. Don't move to that country. There's no way you'll make as much money. You'll be poor because they're poor. You may not be as poor as them, but you'll be a lot poorer than you are here. All the money is here in America. Don't do business somewhere else. All the economy is here in America. Those kinds of mindsets are very prom very dominant in American society, and this is a tool that's used to create them, and it really is powerful. When you look on paper at GDPs, and in the United States, we're so adamant about this is the thing that compares countries. When you look and say, wow, the U.S. leads by so much, how can anyone else be a good place to go. I don't want to go to these other places. They don't have a good GDP. But when you go to the rest of the world, one of the things that's really surprising to Americans is how much no one talks about GDP and nobody cares. And it doesn't take too much of living outside the United States to start to realize why. The GDP numbers don't take into account 
much of anything that matters to real people. Real people don't care about their total economy size. It's meaningless, especially if you're not in one of the giant countries, right? China and the U.S. are enormous countries, and so only they can dominate GDPs. Anybody who's in a small country, your GDP is so small compared to those countries that it's obviously not a comparison. When you look at per capita, well, how does that affect normal people? Normal people don't really care at all. It's not meaningful. And GDPs don't take into account a lot of things that most people care about. Americans tend to care about wealth more than most other people. It is part of the mark of American culture, and that's fine. But it means that Americans see having a score on wealth, whether it's the total amount of money you have in the bank, which very few Americans have a ton in the bank, uh, or how much you have in investments, but investments are a fuzzy thing that are difficult to really put a number on. We do all the time. That's Forbes makes their entire fortune on giving people uh, those numbers, even though they are soft and fungible and don't really mean what people, they, we just like having a score, so we do that, uh, or having GDP or all these different things. Like We have these numbers and it makes Americans feel like they're winning or doing really well, and in some ways they are. But in other countries, those things don't mean anything and there's no one promoting them. And so the idea that we care about our GDP here in Nicaragua or in Uganda or in India is, is pretty strange. People would be like, who cares? What does that mean? It doesn't affect my quality of life. It doesn't affect my education. It doesn't affect my upward mobility. It doesn't affect my social mobility. It doesn't affect my um, uh, cost of living and things that actually matter day to day. GDP doesn't put a roof over your head. GDP doesn't give you good food to eat. It doesn't do any of those things. In fact, when we look at what the U.S. is like, high GDP may actually represent some dangers to being able to provide shelter and quality food and health care. All those things may come at a risk when you're prioritizing GDP. And so for most countries, GDP isn't just unimportant. It may be actively bad. And there's a reason why people ignore it. So I think this is a really important concept because for myself, for sure, coming from America, I'm so used to viewing the world as a GDP comparison, normally in a per capita comparison. I know that looking at total economic size has very little value outside of really just having a very rough idea as to the size of countries or how they can impact each other, who can threaten each other economically. Uh, yes, GDP may be a useful number for that, but when you're talking about real people and how it affects people's everyday lives, GDP even per capita is all but useless. If if you looked at that from an American perspective and said, wow, Nicaraguans have an average household GDP of under $3,000 a year, that's ridiculous. They wouldn't be able to afford to eat or have housing or anything like that. And of course, here in Nicaragua, we have very few homeless. We have very few people starving. We have lots of people living quite poorly, but they are able to provide shelter. They are able to provide food. They're able to provide for their families. They live in safe environments and they're able to go out and do things for a lot of reasons. And some of that is just the weather. Not having to deal with terrible winters makes it a lot easier to survive on a lot less. Americans must have sealed houses. They must have heating. They must have heating oil. Without those things, huge numbers of Americans would literally freeze to death every year. So they have to have a certain amount of economic power just to keep life going. That's pretty important. And here in Nicaragua, you can certainly make do with a lot less because the weather's roughly livable every day of the year. There's never a time you need heat or will freeze to death. There's never a time that you need air conditioning or will expire from exposure as long as you can get into shade and maybe get a breeze. So because of that, yes, it gives Nicaragua some economic advantages in that way. But far beyond that, the ability to have shelter, the ability to buy land, the ability to pass down houses, the ability to just tra uh, tra get transport from location to lo location. People are able to do that on numbers that Americans, if they were only looking at GDP per capita, would say, no, it's not possible. With that little money coming in per person, you wouldn't be able to have all these things. There's less money in some cases. Literally, the average income of a Nicaraguan today is less than the amount I had to pay per month for my health insurance 12 years ago when living in Texas. Think about that insane difference. I had to pay over $3,000 a month in insurance as a requirement. That was that was a tax amount, right? And here that's not even the income. And to think that was supposed to just partially cover my health care in the United States. And here you're getting roads and health care and defense and police and fire and all the things the government provides, school and all those things, all within that per capita budget. And in the United States, that's more than you that's not enough to even meet the healthcare number 12 years ago. So that comparison 
doesn't make any sense when you're looking at the world and assume that GDP is a meaningful number. But once you assume GDP is absolutely meaningless and that things can be provided without being reflected in the GDP, that important factors in life like how happy you are, your development index, your education levels, your social mobility, and especially your cost of living, your ability to have shelter, food, and so forth, are not really represented in a GDP whatsoever. And you could have essentially a GDP approaching zero and still have all those things and do pretty well. It's kind of mind-blowing when GDP has been your worldview. I think it's important, I say, that's like my catchphrase, we should have like a drinking game when I say I think it's important, um, and uh, to, to really step back and say, wow, a lot of these measurements that we use to gauge value of different countries, to gauge power of different countries, are, are very misleading and may not mean what, they, what we think they mean and may be part of a general push, a very soft uh, attempt to make people feel like it's not worth going other places or there's some risk going other places. Low GDPs make us fearful. How could it be safe with such a low GDP? There's not enough money in the economy to pay for police. They can't have a fire department. They can't have ambulances. They can't have hospitals. We clearly would be at great risk. Uh, one criminal would just run rampant over the country, but that is anything but the case. So those GDP numbers are obviously very misleading but it is so tempting to try to use them because it's such a simple number. Humans love simple numbers. One single number, a score that compares one place to another. When you're playing Pac-Man, we use scores to know who did better because there's one thing you're trying to do, get a higher score. But with GDP, we have one country who's out there caring about very little else than getting a high score in their GDP and hundreds of other countries that don't even think about it at all and in many cases aren't even aware of it. There's a score being kept that they don't even know about and they're maximizing nothing to make it look good uh, or maybe intentionally making it look bad so that people are, don't know what their resources are like. So when you're looking at countries, when you're making comparisons, I encourage you to, yes, look at GDP a little bit, but look at it with a critical eye and say, does this give me a meaningful comparison or does this represent just how disparate these two countries are and how little I'm able to compare because this number represents one thing here and another thing over here and gives me no ability to know how either country actually acts economically, socially, uh, from a safety perspective, any number of things. Those numbers just mean nothing. And another country that has a very confusing GDP would be Cuba, where their economy works very differently than most of the countries around them, or most of the countries in the world. Cuba is very unique, and I don't want to say it's good or bad, it's just very different. Then how do you measure GDP in an economy that is so much different even than here in Nicaragua? I have no idea. I don't know what the numbers that they have reflect. According to their GDP numbers, they make many times the income of Nicaragua, but from reports, they're actually potentially poorer or very similar. So that GDP number between us is definitely representing different things, but what is it representing in either case? I have no idea. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support my personal GDP, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That comes directly to me and helps make this show possible. As always, like and subscribe. Tell your friends about the show. Tell some family members that there's this interesting topics about traveling the world, living abroad, economy, all kinds of things. And uh, if you could uh, take a moment to post on social media, I would appreciate it a lot. And I will see all of you tomorrow.